Okay, title of my message this morning. If you have your Bibles, Bibles, yeah. <laughs> Boggles, I never heard of that before. But uh, Exodus chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1, and uh, they say you're always supposed to tell something funny, and I don't have anything funny, I, <laughs> you know, except for the guy who, who proposed and said, will you marry me? And she said, no. And they lived happily ever after. And so that's about. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I told you it's an old one. Most of you know, but a lot of you, maybe you don't. This preacher's at this pastor's conference. And this guy's preaching. And he said, I've lived my entire life in the arms of another woman my mother and boy this preacher said boy isn't that good I just love that so when he got back to his church on Mother's Day he said you know I've spent most of my life in the arms of another woman and he went blank <laughs> <clears throat> he said again he says I've spent most of my life in the arms of another woman and he's still blank he looked over and it looked like his wife and his mother-in-law said his head would look good on the wall. <laughs> Finally, he said, I've spent most of my life in the arms of another woman, and for the life of me, I can't think of her name. <laughs> Amen. I want to talk today about godly moms and grandmas are needed. Godly moms and grandmas are needed. If you'll see in chapter 1, verse 6 of Exodus, Joseph died, and all his brethren and all that generation. And that was a great loss for the nation of Egypt because Joseph was second in command. He was the one who could go between Pharaoh and the people, and the people prospered while Joseph was alive. Then in verse 7 it says this, and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. There we see, after Joseph dies, there's a new Israeli generation that blossoms. Uh, Dr. Henry Moore says he believes there are two to five million Jews in the land of Goshen at this time. And then verse 8 is interesting. And there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. There we see Satan's plant. Satan is diabolical, isn't he? Uh, he knows when to intervene and deceive people. And we have his plant. He's a new, cruel pharaoh. He's a king that rises up to power there. And he didn't know Joseph or how they did the things in a godly way. Interesting verses. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5. O Assyrian. Speaking about the Antichrist, by the way. The rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Verse 12 says, Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, talking about the future and uh, the tribulation and to get ready to go into the kingdom, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of where? Assyria, the Assyrian, and the glory of his high looks. So we believe that the Antichrist, his background will be an Assyrian. He is the Antichrist, the Assyrian. But interesting with our story, it states in Isaiah 52 verse 4, For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Isn't that interesting? Here you have the Assyrian who is Pharaoh and he's pressing Israel. He's oppressing Israel here in Exodus and not only will he do it here, he'll do it later on again. And so Satan, this is his plant in verse 9 of chapter 1. And he said unto his people, Behold, the children of Israel, uh, the children of Israel are more and mightier than, than we. Here we see Pharaoh, he fears Israel's growth, their power, their money. 
You know, if you get a group of Jewish people together, it's not long they're making the money. Have you ever noticed that? And uh, they're good at it. And so uh, that gives them leverage. That gives them power. And so he begins to fear a lot of that. Verse 11, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict the Jews with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, uh, Pithom and Ramesses. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor or hardships. There we see this king's, his solution to the Israel problem. Uh, he sets taskmasters over them. And he made the Jewish people subservient slaves for the people of Egypt. And then he had a final solution for them. It states in chapter 1, verse 22, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, it's a Jew, ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. So if it's a male Jew, get rid of him. Sort of like Hitler in a sense. And the final solution, and this is what he puts together. Satan again was trying to stop the messianic, the messianic line. Satan is a true murderer, is he not? He tried to do it in the past, and he's trying to do it right here. This is the environment of that time, but God. Amen? And let me just say to us, our environment at our time in America is getting horrific. And it's beginning to go against Christian ethics, beliefs, morals, and our country's turning away from God. And it's been systematically going on for many, many years. And so it's going to get tough, and there's some persecution that might come our way unless Christians have the nerve and the courage to stand up for their faith. If people can march for their, uh, their what? Their uh, subject that they're interested in, whatever it may be, and they pour out in the streets, when does a Christian ever stand up? Amen? And it's time that we should. Now, I don't want to get political or not, but when Steve said we're going to Washington, D.C., there's going to be a blast, I kind of put those two things. <laughs> if we had to start all over from Washington, wouldn't it be great? Okay, now, in chapter 2, you don't have to read it, but in chapter 2, God raises up a family a godly family from the tribe of Levi. The dad is Amron. The mom is Jochebed. The son is Aaron. The daughter is Miriam. And the other son is Moses. Her mom now, she nourishes her son, her last one there, of Moses for three months. Remember, she's scared because of the decree, kill all the males. So she keeps him safe. Then her and her family, they develop a plan in order to try to save Moses' life. It states in Hebrews chapter 11, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Even though they were not afraid, they trusted in God, they still hid him because of that commandment. And so they're trying to keep him alive. Now through all of this, you can sense through it a mother's courage, her faith, her love for her child. So she puts together, together a water crocodile proof tiny basket. It's called an ark. And she's trusting God. She places her baby among the bulrushes along the river's edge there. She appoints her daughter, Miriam, to set a watch while her mom prays. I personally believe that Miriam was an attendant to Pharaoh's daughter because Miriam knew exactly when and where Pharaoh's daughter went to bathe. Pharaoh's daughter would even talk to her. So she had some kind of association there. Upon finding the ark, God puts into the heart of Pharaoh's daughter compassion that she thought about this Hebrew's baby to be safe. In actuality, she wants this baby for herself. 
She wants him. I don't know if she's having trouble uh, giving birth, but she wants this child. And so as a result of that, Miriam sees that. And Miriam says, listen, uh, do you want me to go get a Hebrew woman to be able to nurse the child? And Pharaoh's daughter said, you know, that's a good idea. <laughs> and so who do you think Miriam went and got? The mother, <laughs> who is her mom, Miriam's mom, and Moses' mom. And so goes and gets her. So Pharaoh's daughter talks to Jochebed, Moses' mom, and uh, she said this to her, you take this baby home, you nurse him there, and I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll pay you wages if you'll do that. Isn't that amazing how God works sometimes, huh? Going to pay wages to nurse her own child. And so then when he's finished and he's done nursing, perhaps potty training, whatever it might be, I want you to bring him back. And what I'll do then, I'll raise him as my son. So the mom, Pharaoh's daughter doesn't know it's the mom. The mom then, she went, she nursed him, raised him up to a certain point, and then took, her, took him back to Pharaoh's daughter there. And Pharaoh's daughter names him Moses because it means he was drawn forth out of the water. Now, within the very house of Pharaoh, Israel's future out-of-Egypt deliverer was being raised. Isn't that something how God works at times? Only God could perform something like that. But it started in a godly home. No doubt the family, the mother, they often saw Moses and helped him to become strong in his faith, teaching him in a sense of resisting to yield to Egypt's pagan idolatry and pleasures of sin for a moment because there was something inside of him. I believe his family and especially his mother won his heart because it says in verse 24 through 26, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Can you imagine that? Everything you ever wanted is at his hands. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto recompense of the reward. So here we have Moses. He takes his stand. He had a godly home, Jochebed. Evidently, she influenced Moses to have a heart for the Hebrew people. And God rewarded a mother's faith and tenacity. He had a mother who would not quit. And as a result of that, Moses chose what was right, what was truth. He chose God over all that Egypt could offer him. And it was at his grasp. Now we know while Moses was there, he saw and learned of Egypt's sins, the pleasure for a season. You know, I'm sure he saw that most sins is exciting in its appeal. Sin a lot of time comes in lights that's luring. You know, it's like when you go fishing. You put bait on a hook to hide the hook in order to deceive the fish so you can catch him and eat him. Amen? Our country, TV, Hollywood, our universities, our media, they bait people. They make things that are unethical, not the truth, sinful, immoral, wrong, but they have the ability of making those things that are wrong and sinful exciting, attractive, Seemingly fulfilling. Huh? The world is good at it, isn't it? But they don't reveal the consequences, do they? They just, it's gu you know, gusto, have one, whatever. It's exciting. You're going to party. Everybody's going to be half naked. It's going to have a lot of fun. 
Uh, this is a good time. It's a good thing. And they don't say anything that we reap what we sow. Whether it's lying or drugs or alcohol or sex or anti-country, anti-God, materialism, whatever it might be, sin is exciting in its appeal. I'm sure Moses saw that. He also saw that sin is deceiving in its beginning. Satan is the great deceiver. You know, a little petting with, you know, your girlfriend or boyfriend, that's okay. Now she's pregnant. Now you're even considering abortion. It's deceiving in its beginning, is it not? It was just a little social drink. But now I'm a drunkard. I'm an alcoholic. Any ex-drinkers here that would say amen to me for that? Huh? Amen. Oh, it's nice, it's fun, it's good. A little drink's not going to hurt anybody. One out of ten people that ever put alcohol to the lips end up an alcoholic. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? A man in Canada, he couldn't get the trash people to bring a truck out and pick up his trash and garbage. He had a little bit, and they couldn't get him to come out to where he was. So... What he did, he went and got a large box, he wrapped it in real bright paper and put a bow on it. Then he went out to the road and set it down at the road's edge. He said it wasn't long that this truck came by, uh, just pickup truck, ran out real fast, grabbed that, threw it in the back truck and sped away. <laughs> I wonder what they thought when they opened it. It's deceiving in its beginning, is it not? Amen? This is a true story. Uh, when I was out in Arizona preaching to the Apache Indians out there, uh, there was this, uh, uh, it was in the paper that this Indian, uh, he got this real nice looking suitcase and he caught a bobcat and he put that bobcat in that suitcase. He took that suitcase out by the road and he went up on a hill and he watched and you imagine the heat in Arizona coming down, there's a bobcat in that suitcase. Not long after that, there were four men in this great big Cadillac. And it pulled up, the door opened, they picked that suitcase up, took it in, shut the door, they took off. And he said they went just a few yards down the road, the brakes slammed on and all four doors. <laughs> what you got in there? <laughs> Let that baby loose. It's deceiving in its beginning, is it not? Moses saw that sin is empty in its ability to satisfy. Sin can never satisfy you. You know, I was a great sinner. I could sin with the best of them. And I tried to throw everything I possibly could in that hole that was in my heart. And I always came up empty. The only thing that has filled it is the Lord Jesus Christ. When I trusted that Christ died for my sins, he was buried, he rose again, I put my faith in Christ and that gospel, he filled my heart. I am complete in him now. Thank God for that. It's empty. Moses saw that sin is binding in its power. How many people have said, I want to do right, I want to stop sinning, I just can't do it. And their flesh just continues to drive them. They're like they're in a spider web. The more they, they move, the more entangled and grip it has upon them. Proverbs 23, 29 says this here. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, and they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it is given his color in the cup, when, in, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. You lose complete control. That's what happens to you. And it's binding in its power. You can take a piece of thread and wrap it around your hand and just break it. But if you do that several times and you try to break it, 
you can't break it. And sin will get you at first, you can break it. But later on, it keeps on going till finally you have a grip and you're at the devil's mercy. 2 Timothy 2.25 says, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and it goes on to state in verse 26, guys. I really need that verse if you wouldn't mind. It talks about being taken captive at the devil's will. Isn't that amazing? That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. It's sin is binding in its power. And sin also is, uh, is destructive in its effort. James 1.15 says this here, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Sin will destroy your health. It will leave scars. It will destroy your self-respect. It will bring shame to those that you love if you follow that. And it's just a little bit at the time, but finally it will destroy you. Man had four pigs. He led them to the slaughterhouse. They just followed him. The guy in the slaughterhouse said, how in the world did you get them to follow you to a place like this? He said, oh, I just threw down a few beans every now and then, here or there. And that's what the devil does. He throws a few beans here for you and a few beans for you, and you end up at the slaughterhouse, and you'll be completely destroyed. He also saw that sin is dooming in its end. He saw the Egyptians die without God. And when you die without God, you die without hope. But Moses here, his family and his mom, in an unbelievable culture, you talk about anti-Semitic, Egypt at that time was anti-Semitic. But she had enough faith and courage that influenced Moses to stay the course. And in that environment, when you look at their family, you think of what her children accomplished. Her son Aaron became Israel's first high priest. Miriam, her daughter, became the worship leader and served with Moses. And then Moses became the great deliverer, and he was one of the greatest men who ever walked on this earth. It's an amazing what a godly family can do to impact and influence their kids. So today, mothers, yes, you need to do your best in giving your kids time, love, discipline, faith and fear of God, resistance to evil, to be humble, respectful, educated, and to love God with all their heart. Yes, you need to pray for your kids daily that they would be responsible, accountable when they do wrong, to run with the right godly people, to stand and use biblical truth even when culture is saying otherwise. Now don't miss this next part. I'm coming down stretch here. But mothers... You have to stop making other things more important than motherhood. You have to stop making other things more important than motherhood. Regardless of what culture, society, entertainment, academia, so-called experts, government says about women, God honors motherhood as a priority. And for the last few years, we're seeing role reversal. Men are becoming wimpy, and ladies are becoming masculine. Go to the movies and see who's in charge. Even my great-granddaughter. The other day, she was riding her bicycle, and she fell off, and she skinned her elbow and her knee. And I said to her, I said, did you cry? She said, you know, I started to, but then I realized I'm a strong woman. <laughs> I said, God, here we go. <laughs> Karen and I, when 
we were at Tennessee Temple. She got a job at a bank in an employment office that hired the people, and she loved that she was looking for that. And she got the job, but with two kids and me a student and doing jobs on the side, on the side, our home was upside down. Our pastor at that time, Dr. Jerry Ben, he said, make a list of the pros and the cons. So we made a list. All the pros meant what we could have, the material things. Up on the other side were the things that really mattered, home, family, happiness, God, on and on it went. And so I had to make a decision, but I look at my list, and the Bible says, step out by faith, as they say. And we stepped out by faith. I said, well, stop your job. I didn't know how we were going to live, but I, when I left there, I didn't know anything. God provided every step of the way. I believe God honors motherhood. That's being so taken away from our culture and society today. You know, our junior high leaders see every Friday night about 75 to 90 kids, and many of these kids are poor kids. Their home's a mess. Many are unloved because of absentee parents from their lives. And the debris in their lives, it's unbelievable. They're way behind in having a chance in life. Your family needs you, you uh, moms and grandmothers especially. Men, yes, but moms and grandmothers. There's just a connection there. And what if inside one of your kids there might be a Moses, an Aaron, a Miriam, or perhaps a Paul, a Lydia, a Les Feldy, those kids are just waiting for a dad or a mom to live for God and live for them. That would impact them to be willing, because they've seen it in mom and dad and the family, to come forth and say, I want to be what God wants me to be. I remember meeting two men. There were two men. They were brothers in Canada. One was a pastor he used to lead Bible conferences, and he wrote materials for churches all across Canada. The other man, the brother, was an evangelist. He was greatly sought after, and he spoke all over Canada. Kara and I, when I was a student at Tennessee Temple, we met these two brothers' mother while attending a church there in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Her name was Elsie Lawson. Elsie Lawson, she was a widow. And her husband who passed had been a pastor. And anyway, she, uh, after we left, she later left and went back to Canada. We went up there a couple times, visited her and Dr. Ben, had a wonderful fellowship with her. And she would just lift our spirits up. She is a wonderful lady. But later, Mrs. Lawson, Elsie, she died. The police and the coroner went into her apartment and all over her mirrors were these little pieces of paper with individual names on them that she had been praying for. Carol and my name were, were on one of those little sheets. The coroner and the policeman said, this is a godly lady. And do you know who was at the top of her list that she had there on her mirror? Her two sons. Huh? So I ask you, can a godly mom help impact their kids? Oh my goodness. There's no limitation. Just so you're willing to live for God yourself. Amen? Amen? That little baby is saying, stand up and live for him. I could hear it. How about you? Father, we love you. And I just pray that as we have our heads bowed even right now,
that a mom or a dad, a grandma, who might be here this morning, who have never been saved, they've never put their faith in the gospel. The fact that Christ died for their sins, he was buried, and he rose again. And that is sufficient to save them. And I just pray that even right now they would understand they cannot be the mother, the grandmother, who they ought to be without Jesus Christ being in their heart, their life. But first of all, they have to get saved for that to begin. And so I just pray that even at this moment right now, there'll be somebody in this audience that would say in their heart, God, I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. But I do believe that Jesus Christ is your son. He died for my sins and rose again. God, I believe this truth. I accept this truth in my heart. And if you prayed that with me at that moment and you meant it in your heart, after the service, please come up and just say, give me one of those booklets for new believers. And I'll give you one and you can walk away. That's fine. But my challenge is to the rest of the ladies here. How you doing, Mom? How you doing, Grandma? What a day to dedicate your life and your soul to the Lord once again. Your kids are counting on you. They're dependent on you. Don't let them down. In Jesus' name. And everybody said... We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person Sunday at 10 a.m. in New Whiteland. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you is our prayer.